But after 10.15, it's time for member statements. And the first statement this morning goes to the member for London Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Everyone in this House can agree that the state makes a terrible parent. Children rise to a challenge when expectations are high. But for kids in care, Crown Wards, the bar is incredibly low. For every 1,000 kids who age out of care, 400 graduate high school, 80 enroll in university, and 8 complete those studies. That's not even 1%. Jane Koverikova, founder of the Child Welfare Political Action Committee, met with me in 2018 after I was first elected. I was immediately inspired by her story of determination and success. Jane aged out of care, but never gave up on her dream of a post-secondary education. Today I rise to celebrate an enormous achievement in my riding. After many fantastic discussions with the Child Welfare PAC, Huron, Brescia, Kings and Univer Western University, will offer 35 individuals who age out of care the opportunity of a lifetime, financial resources they need for a university degree. Education opens doors, inspires, and brightens futures. I'm incredibly thankful to Huron, Brescia, Kings, and Western University for their commitment to our community. This historic leadership illustrates how Londoners care about one another and promote a kinder, more just, and brighter community. To all Crown Wards who age out of care, Regardless of your age, Huron, Brescia, Kings, and Western University believe in you. We believe in your bright future. Speaker, this is life-changing work, and it has been an incredible honor to be a part of it. Thank you, and to, to all members in the House, uh, I know as you're entering now, there's conversation going on, and we do have important state statements to make. So please, if you could keep the noise down, and uh, we'll continue with the member from Flamborough, Glenbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express how proud I am of the measures our government has taken to ease the pressures on the health care system in my hometown of Hamilton. Days ago, our health minister announced that 60 transitional care beds will be added to St. Joseph's Villa in Dundas. And I can't emphasize enough how significant this announcement is for health care in Hamilton and surrounding areas. 60 additional beds will alleviate the stress on acute care capacity at the two major hospital systems in our city, St. Joseph's Healthcare and Hamilton Health Sciences. The additional transitional beds will help reduce wait times by transferring patients out of acute care and into home or long-term care settings much faster. Building capacity is critical to reducing wait times at hospitals in Hamilton. This new reactivation centre will create more care spaces in Hamilton so patients can heal and return home sooner. The 60 additional transitional beds will be moved into a renovated tower at St. Joseph's Villa. The community is overjoyed by this announcement. They've been working on this project for more than a decade, and our government is going a step further. We are working with St. Joseph's Villa in an effort to fast-track this project. St. Joe's Villa is just one piece of a larger plan to create more than 230 transitional beds across Ontario. I'm so proud to be part of a government that is taking action to ease pressures on acute care hospitals and supporting ongoing efforts to end hallway health care in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next statement, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, developmental services agencies and families were shocked to learn, with merely one day's notice, that the Conservative government was seeking applications for individuals and stakeholders to take part in consultations about reforming the developmental services sector. Last year around this time, a leaked contract showed the Ford government was looking to pay an external organization up to $1 million to help find a way to make cuts, cuts that directly affect people with developmental or intellectual disabilities. We know that people-minded business has been retained by the Ford government to carry this out. Families and stakeholders were given virtually no warning about the upcoming sessions, and many scrambled to submit applications by the deadline, with just hours' notice. 
Major organizations like Community Living Ontario received no direct communication from the ministry about these consultations, and I received numerous emails from individuals who were extremely upset by the secrecy of these consultations. Mr. Speaker, agencies in the developmental services sector have not received a base funding increase in well over a decade. Families continue to struggle with wait lists, lack of housing options, poverty level ODSP, and scarce support services available to them. There are many issues that desperately need to be addressed, but secret, hand picked, behind closed doors consultations for the purpose of making cuts are wrong and disrespectful. Paying consultants $1 million to reduce expenditures, also known as make cuts, while, those people, while people struggling during a pandemic, is disgraceful. I'm urging the government to scrap this farce of a consultation and truly engage with the sector and individuals without trying to save money at their expense. Member Statements. The member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today and announce an important investment by the Government of Ontario in Lambton County and Sarnia. As part of the government's ongoing efforts to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing will be providing immediate assistance to Lambton County with over $1.2 million in social service relief funding. This money will go towards rent relief the expansion of short-term rental supplements, emergency shelter solutions, and much-needed renovations to the Haven Youth Shelter in Sarnia. This relief funding is in addition to over $2.8 million in funding that was directed to Lambton County by the provincial government at the outside of the pandemic to support critically important social services. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that our government is making these investments to help protect the health and safety of the most vulnerable people in Lambton County. As a government, we are working hard or working hand in hand with our municipal partners to make sure they have the tools and flexibility they need to keep people safe. On behalf of the residents of Lambton County, I would like to say thank you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing for his continued support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. I met with members of the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network yesterday. They wanted to share their new patient survey with me. The report shows that the delay in cancellation of cancer care due to COVID-19 has triggered another public health crisis. Cancer patient, their caregiver, and those awaiting confirmation of a cancer diagnosis are facing postponed and canceled appointment tests and treatments, causing heightened fears and anxiety, even as the pandemic restrictions are lifted. We need to get our healthcare system moving again in the interest of people's health. Safe and timely access to cancer care, including diagnosis, testing, and treatment, must remain a top priority, even during the second wave of COVID. The report says that to save lives, cancer care and diagnosis must continue during any public health crisis. Speaker, Ontario pandemic plan must explicitly include essential cancer care. Cancer can't be cancelled or postponed. Cancer survivors want a system that never cancels treatment, tests, or diagnostics procedures for cancer patients. I believe we can get there, Speaker, but I have some serious doubts in this government's ability to get us there when they seem to prioritize pinching pennies and backroom deals for their friends. Speaker, cancer can't wait. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. It's an honour to rise in the House today to speak to an important issue facing our municipalities and the people of Ontario. Last week, the government introduced Bill 218, which would revoke the right of all municipalities in Ontario to hold their local elections under a ranked ballot system. The government opted to revoke this right unilaterally without consultation. By doing so, the government is taking choice away from local governments like Kingston, Cambridge and Toronto and reversing an election process that the City of London has already adopted and invested in, taking choice away from citizens who already chose to opt in to this system and to participate in it to elect their local government. I urge the Ford government not to rush this process. It's clear that the stakeholders did didn't ask for this legislation, many grassroots groups have been pushing for ranked ballots for years. Can the government 
demonstrate which local municipality, which mayor, which councillor has asked for this to be done. Just last night, I attended a panel organized by Dave Meslin, founder of the Ranked Ballot Initiative of Toronto, and hundreds of others. I can speak firsthand to the strong opposition to Schedule 2 of Bill 218. What is the government so afraid of that they are rushing the bill through? No one wants to revert back to 1867, first past the post. I will be voting against Bill 218, and the Ford government is urged to not jam through this legislation, but instead listen to ordinary people. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. This month in Canada, we recognize Women's History Month. October 18th marked the anniversary of the legal ruling that under the Canadian Constitution, women were able to be included as qualified persons and could sit in the Senate. Emily Murphy, one of the famous five who fought for this recognition, was born in Cookstown, which is part of Innisfil today. Innisfil has a proud legacy of female achievement. Lynn Dolan, the mayor of Innisfil, was re the recipient of the 2020 Woman of Influence and Local Government Award from Municipal World, and former South Simcoe Police Service Deputy Chief Robin McCleary Downer has served as aide de camp for various left uh, tenant governors since 2002. McCleary Downer started her career in policing with the OPP in 1981. In 1992, she broke a glass ceiling and became the first woman to serve as a detachment commander in the rank of staff sergeant. In 1999, she was named Officer of the Year by the International Association of Women Police. After serving as Chief Adjudicator for the OPP, she joined the South Simcoe Service as Deputy Chief and the first woman to hold that rank. Earlier this month, Deputy Chief Robin McCleary Downer became Chief Au du Camp for Lieutenant Governor Dowswell. I'm very happy for her. I congratulate her, and I'm very proud to represent a riding that has so much history of women progressing forward. Thank you. Member Statements, Member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. For Ontario's northern communities, air transportation is essential, a lifeline for many reasons. In Thunder Bay, our airport is a hub for most of northern Ontario. Planes flying in and out of that airport provide essential services, bringing goods and people to communities, and they ensure that our residents have access to health care. Medevacs, locums, Health professionals, police officers, tradespeople, business people, and minors are all on those planes and deserve to be safe. Many of our COVID tests need to be flown to Toronto because we don't have sufficient resources to complete them. But airports across northern Ontario are in trouble. Since the pandemic, airport traffic and passenger numbers have decreased substantially. And now, nearly eight months later, that drop in revenue have them facing large fiscal deficits. As the second wave continues to spread through the province and as we move closer to winter, northern airports are looking towards making hard choices about hours of operation and services. Frankly, it's not a pretty picture. While there has been some help from the federal government with wage subsidies to the airport in Thunder Bay, it was not enough. At the provincial level, we need to do something for airports and ensure that vital link to health care. Now is the time for all of us at Queen's Park to step up and secure the future of airports in the north, the people of Thunder Bay and all the people who live across northern Ontario deserve nothing less. Next, we have the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to acknowledge three outstanding young men from the city of Peterborough. Just over two weeks ago, on October 13th, Jesse Davis, the oldest son of a friend of mine, John Davis, jacked his car up to crawl underneath it to address an exhaust leak, and the jack failed. The car came crushing down on Jesse. His mother-in-law did everything she could to help, but Jesse was in a dire situation on the side of the road. Thankfully, Tim, Cody, and Chase Nadeau happened to be driving by and realized something was wrong. They stopped, got out of their car, and immediately upon seeing the situation Jesse was in, lifted the car up enough that he was able to crawl out. I can't thank the NATOs enough for their selfless and heroic act that day. It would have been so easy for them to have just driven by. Had they not stopped, I could be giving a eulogy this morning for Jesse. But instead, we're celebrating their actions. Jesse's father, John, has told me that he now considers the NATOs to be part of his family. I know the last few months have been incredibly challenging for all of us. Thankfully, though, 
we still have selfless people like Cody, Tim, and Chase, willing to stop and help a complete stranger. Angels do walk among us. Thank you. Member statements. Member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to take a moment to highlight a fantastic organization in my riding of Carleton. The Osgood Youth Centre is a non-profit association that provides services to rural youth uh, in Osgood and surrounding areas. Normally, Mr. Speaker, students would be able to drop into their after-school programs or attend summer camps when school is out, but with the pandemic, they, just like every other organization and association in Carleton and across this province, have had to change how they provide their services. Mr. Speaker, the one thing I can say about the Osgood Youth Association, and in fact all associations in Carleton, is how resilient they are and how willing they are to adapt to meet the needs of youth and students and people in the riding who need it the most. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the Osgood Youth Association actually started doing online programs. And one of the things they did, Mr. Speaker, was a virtual community cooking class. I was pleased to join that virtual community cooking class uh, on a Wednesday evening a few weeks ago and share with the youth of Osgood my secret chicken wing recipe and homemade coleslaw, which uh, the Minister um, of, uh, of Infrastructure, or sorry, Minister of Labor, my apologies. <laughs> Minister McNaughton is still asking for that recipe. But I just wanted to thank the Osgood Youth Association for everything they're doing, and I look forward to joining them in December for my sugar cookie recipe. Thank you. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. The member for Timmins has informed me he has a point of order. He wishes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I. Mr. Speaker, I. Order. Member for Timmins. Thank you, I would ask that we have unanimous consent to stand down our leads as we await the Premier. I take it he's uh, coming today. We're not going to make reference to the absence of any member, but uh, Member for Timmins has sought, sought the unanimous consent of the House to stand down the leads of the official opposition. Agreed? No. no.